Big outdoor corporate companies always seem to hide behind a website. You never know who's running them. Nemo Equipment is the top seller of sleeping pads and sleeping bags in the US. I wanted to know how they do this. Are they just owned by some corporation? Is it a group of money hungry investors? Also, why don't they sell trekking pole tents? And why don't they make gear out of Dyneema? Well, I was able to find the man in charge and convinced him to come on my channel to give me answers. Finally, uh, finally meeting you. I've, I've never even, I've never even seen you before. Yeah, well, in fact, uh, when I talked to Kate on our side, who's been helping set this up, she said that you mentioned that I seem kind of elusive. <laughs> <laughs> um, Which is not my yeah. intentions. Well, well, it's funny because, okay, I, you know, I, Okay, I, I got lots of questions for you, but do you, so do you? I guess this would and this will help me answer that question or answer that uh, thought, I should say, or just sort of do you? W would you consider Nemo to be like a a big company, a big brand, or what is your thought on that? Because th here's why I say that because yeah, the, I feel like you know cottage brands, right? Like the small guys, you know, guys in their garage they're the ones that are like just begging to get on YouTube channels, right? Like yeah. that. I mean, I'll get email, I'll get phone calls, I'll get texts and I, I totally understandable, right? They want to, it's got this grassroots company, right? They're trying to kick it yeah. off and brands. I feel like, you know, you, uh, big Agnes, you know, some of the other bigger or brands that people, um, uh, sort of have like this perception of a big, Brand, it's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, the guy hiding behind the curtain. Nobody's going to see him, or is there yeah, anybody there, yeah. or is it just run by the machine? So that's probably why I said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Damn, well, is the Wizard of Oz? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a good question. I mean, definitely don't consider ourselves a big brand. Um, my passion is really in making things. Um, yep. And honestly, that's what we focus on every day, and I think that's that's gotten the brand's attention by making good product. And, uh, and, you know, and so, you know, really all the way back to 2005 when we debuted the brand and we won the ISPO brand new award, we've had good attention from third parties. So we haven't had to go asking for it. And I probably would be reluctant to do that anyway, just by personality. Okay. So you started in 2005? Started in 2002, actually. Um, okay. So I, I incorporated the business when I was a senior in design school. It was actually my senior thesis project at the Rhode Island School of Design. And uh, and I, you know, I was 25 years old and pretty naive. Um, but my aspiration was to kind of take the ingenuity of Petzl, the strength, the brand of Patagonia, and the mastery of construction of Arcteryx and mash them into, into one brand. This is my 25-year-old mind, you know? Okay. And, uh, and so I, you know, I focused my senior thesis on starting the company and three days after graduation moved into our first office space, an old mill space in Nashville, New Hampshire. And it took two years basically to make the first functional prototypes of our air supported tents. We started with these tents that, you know, had inflated ribs in them. And, uh, and then it was about another year of sorting out how to actually step that prototyping up to more like manufacturing. And uh, and then we launched, we, we debuted the brand when we won. Well, technically we debuted the brand at the OR show in the in the summer of 2004, but no one, we were in the back pavilion, no one saw us. When we really started to get visibility was when we won the, the big award for innovation out of Germany um, at the ISPO show in 2005. And that was kind of the official public kind of getting rolling. Okay. So, so you were, you came straight out of college. Is that what I'm hearing you say to start it the brand? Is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, I, didn't, you I, didn't work for some other big brand or. No, I had the courage like of all. ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I feel like you've done a really good job. I mean, if you don't consider yourself, a, I, I'm, I'm curious, can I ask you how many, how many employees do you have? Like well, how many guys work for the. We've got about 50 people here at our headquarters in Dover. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. I mean, I would consider that a fairly sizable company for an outdoor brand personally. I mean, and if you don't, I feel like you've marketed yourself to sure look like one. I mean, well, you're... you know, it's interesting. We get that a lot. You know, people will see the people that see the inner workings are surprised that we're as small a company as we are, because I, I think the brand at this point has good presence. I mean, just 
in point of fact, we are the number one specialty hard goods camp brand in North America now. Um, you know, we have the most selling sleeping bags. We've got the most selling pads. Um, and- really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. That So, okay. So I, I didn't know that. So you're telling me you're beating all the other big brands out there as far yeah. as sales go, as far as the sleeping bags and stuff like that. That's got to be pretty amazing. And it's so, but two, so 2002 was the official launch, I think you said, right? And then 05, yeah. you kind of really kicked off. Yeah. Right. Does yeah. that feel like yesterday for you? I mean, is that, is that has time flown for you? You know, it's. I just got my invitation to my thirtieth high school reunion yesterday. Um, so, so it's, <laughs> hey, it's I'm a, with you, man. I, I graduated in '96. When what year did right you graduate? '94. Yeah. Yeah, '94. Yep. So. <clears throat> yeah. So yep. it's yeah something on my mind at the moment. It's a timely question, but yeah, you know, I don't. You know, in some ways, right? I mean, what I think when it feels like a long time ago is when I really look back on some of those experiences. I mean. I've grown a lot as a person. The products have evolved a ton. The team here has changed a ton. Even our industry participate. I mean, so much has has evolved over the last 22 years. Um, you know, if I think hard on it, it's been quite a journey. Yeah, I bet. So um I, I got some questions for you that I wrote down here. I'm just, I'm just, I guess I'm just sort of curious. Um, what kind of a I mean, did you have an outdoor background? prior to this? Yeah. So I, I fell in love with the outdoors um, in terms of my backyard and kind of the woods around me when I was a little kid. I mean, I, I, for whatever reason, I did not enjoy television. I was kind of always out, you know, playing in the yard, riding my bike, messing around in the woods. Man, times have changed. Holy cow. Yeah. 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 And then I, I'd say that took more of a, a outdoor activity as we think of it. Um, angle when I got to middle school. I had a a middle school science teacher who ran our kind of semi-formal middle school outing club. And she was a a Dartmouth grad who still had access to the Dartmouth outing club cabins, which are these wonderful little cabins sprinkled around uh, the White Mountains. And uh, and she would take us on trips out to those Nordic skiing in the winter, you know, hiking in the fall and spring. And, And that really, I just, I fell in love with the sense of self-reliance, honestly, like I, I loved being able to, you know, put the things I needed to be comfortable sort of indefinitely, you know, like to carry what you need to survive on your back. I thought it was just fascinating thing. And, uh, and then I did some adventure camps in the summers and, and, uh, and then when I got to college, I went to college in, in Vermont, I fell in love with rock climbing and ice climbing and ice climbing became my passion for quite a while. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, what, what was the spark for you to create gear, to create tents, create pads? And was it just like you, you were sleep? Were you sleeping on somebody else's sleeping pad being like, well, this sucks? <laughs> Basically, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think it's actually I, I reflect on this quite a bit because it'd be so different to start an emo today than it was 20 years ago and that it would have been even 20 years before that. Right. So, you know, when the when the kind of founders of our industry, the the current generation of the industry um, kicked off all the iconic brands that we think of now, like around the 70s. There was so much white space, right? I mean, these folks were solving big, wide open problems. Like, how do we climb this big rock wall in a safer way, you know, or how do we tackle these remote mountains um, with a little more comfort and safety? And, uh, you know, so I when I came into the industry, when I really fell in love with those activities was in the nineties and it was evolving. There was some more formal industrial design coming into the industry, but there was still a lot of rock climbers and mountaineers making gear for themselves. And, uh, and so when I was, uh, basically I went to college twice, like I said, I went to college in Vermont liberal arts school. And then I ended up going back to design school, knowing that I was, that I wanted to start Nemo when I was, um, when I was in art school, sort of second time around in college, I was heading up to uh, to Mount Washington to to ice climb Huntington Ravine uh, with a good buddy of mine, and you know we were twenty something and 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 a little cocky, so we didn't check the weather as well as we should have. And you know we it was a Friday night. We were going to hike up as much of the mountain as we could and kind of stage ourselves to do this ice climbing this ice climb on Saturday and then kind of get back early in the day. Sure enough, huge storm blows in. 
and we end up bivvying out on the side of the mountain. And, you know, if you or your listeners have spent a night in a bivvy, you, you, you know how, how rugged that can be, especially in a, in a winter setting when you've dug into the side of a mountain, you're basically in a drippy snow cave. And, uh, and so I spent all night not really sleeping, trying to sort of balance suffocating in the bivvy versus having snow blow right in my face. You know, you're trying to get fabric lined up and, and, uh, and thinking what a terrible solution, you know, this system was that I was laying in. And the picture I had in my mind, Dan, was what if I took this inflatable sleeping pad that I'm laying on and I had four of them like attached to each other along their long edges to form like a little tunnel? You know, man, that would be that would be quiet and it would be insulating and uh, and it would stay off my face. Um but, you know, as I'm sort of ruminating on this miserable all night, I'm thinking, well, the problem with that is it would weigh a ton and how would you inflate it? And what if you got a leak in it? Out of that came this idea of what if I just had a simple little inflated rib, just one little inflated tube that kept the bivy off my face. And uh, and that became our first product idea was just, you know, what if you could you possibly make really lightweight inflated tubes that were faster to set up? you know, kind of more resilient, smaller packing, maybe easy to re- easier to repair in the field than standard poles. And uh, and we sort of ran with that for years. So were you thinking like in that moment, I, were you already planning to start a gear company or was just like, was yeah. this just like, oh, okay. All right. So you were, you were on yeah. the test and you're thinking, okay, I gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and then, and then that product obviously evolved into a bunch of other stuff. What, what's, what is starting a company like? Is it, is it at that point, you're just like, you know, your tunnel vision, you're thinking about your own thing, or is it, is this like sort of peeking over the wall, looking at what everybody else is doing a little of both maybe? Yeah. Well, you know, it's a good question. And I, I, that's another thing I've, I've thought about a lot over the years is people have asked me that question, you know, or looked for guidance on starting their own thing. I think, I think, you know, I benefited from being young, as I sort of joked about earlier, I, I had the bravery of ignorance, um, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into. So I wasn't asking a lot of questions. And I, I think the result was I had a picture in my mind of kind of the first few steps of it. Um, and I went for it. And, you know, over the years, as we've faced new challenges, we figured them out. I actually think that's even if I even if I started a business today with all that I know after the last 22 years, I would try to bring that mindset because I think I think if you go into anything, whether it's an adventure or, you know, an entrepreneurial um, uh, challenge like Nemo, if you try to map out every step from A to Z before you get started, you're going to be blind to the things that that come your way, right? I mean, we find the same thing when we take trips in the outdoors, like to some degree, right? You want to, you want to be prepared, you want to have a good idea of where you're going, but you also want to be receptive to information as it comes at you and able to right. adapt. And um, so, you know, that's the answer is I had some ideas. I had a vision um, of what I wanted Nima to be. I actually said in my thesis, I want to build a lasting and iconic brand and that we still repeat that almost weekly here. Um, that's still what guides us is to do something important and to do something lasting to make decisions based on a long-term time frame, not, um, not in a short-sighted way. Um, but I didn't, there was so much I didn't know. And I think I actually benefited from that. Where, where does the name come from, Nemo? Yeah, it was a hard challenge figuring. It was actually one of the sort of single hardest problems we've had to solve was what to call the company. And on the short list in the end was New England Mountain Outfitters. Kind oh, of okay. Of, you know, there's there's a number of brands in our industry that are acronyms that. So it had nothing to do with Dory, is what you're telling me. No, no. Well, and so like <laughs> years later, when the when the when the when the, when the, when the movie came out, I panicked because I, I was sure. I bet. I, I was sure we were going to get a cease and desist letter. You know, like I think literally the day I I saw the movie announcement, I was looking, for, you know, pulling up the old list of names, looking for new URLs, but we we never did get the cease and desist letter, fortunately. Okay, so it's uh yeah it's a yeah all right, it's a, it's initials essentially. It was an acronym in the first place. We we've since dropped that. I mean, it's really just Nemo. Okay, um, so it, w- when you're I guess today, fast forward to today, um, 
Do you have a target audience? Do you have a target person? Or, or is there different departments within Nemo that you're like, hey, this one, these guys are the mountaineers. These guys are the backpackers. These guys are the, you know, the the dads who bring their families on the weekends. You know, these are the targets, plural. Yeah. Or, yeah. or kind of what, when you're in your mind, who are you selling to? There are multiple targets. You know, I would be, I would be lying if I didn't say that I'm not one of them, you know, from the, yeah. at the very beginning, the truth is I was really designing stuff that I thought was cool. And actually, I remember we we took our product line to one of our biggest customers back in those early years. And, and you know, after we kind of proudly showed them everything, all, all these cool samples and stuff, the buyer said, these are the coolest, most innovative tents I've ever seen. They're also overpriced and designed for each of our leasing <laughs> segments. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And, and he was right. And I thought to myself, yeah, that's because I made... I made myself a mountaineering tent. I made myself a backpacking tent. I made myself, you know, my version of a bivy tent. And, uh, and, you know, since then, you know, we've gotten, I'd say more and more disciplined about looking past ourselves to really what the customer wants and, and learning from experience, you know, putting things out in the market. But the other thing, Dan, I'm sure you've seen as well is like participation is changing, you know, and, and I remember when I was in high school, uh, you know, I think a lot of what drove me into this space was sort of circling back to something I said in the beginning. I've always been a little introverted. I, I like quiet time. I like being in my own head, I, you know, and I, I enjoyed going out into the woods and having that time of reflection and introspection. I liked being disconnected, you know, and I like kind of testing to see what I was made of. And so that's sort of how I came into the industry. The industry was sort of all about that for a long time. It was like these solo suffer fests out in the mountains testing yeah. your metal. And I remember sometime in the mid 2000s, I was flipping through, I think it was Backpacker Magazine. And I saw an ad from one of the big iconic uh, gear brands at the time. And it showed this guy in his sleeping bag with this like, you know, fear stricken look in his, in his face. And the, the caption said something about how he had just made a failed attempt, you know, to summit whatever big mountain in the Himalayas and barely made it back to his tent and blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking a couple things. One, I don't know if this image is appealing now to the new generation of outdoor participants. You know, like fundamentally, I don't know how many people are looking at this and thinking, this miserable looking guy, I want to be him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing I thought was also, if you're the gear brand who made that sleeping bag and tent, shouldn't the look on his face now that he's back in his sleeping bag and tent be relief? You know, right. Like, right. Like, Phew, here I am back in my crazy right. bag. Thank <laughs> God, you know, I survived that crazy epic. So from that moment on, that was another one of those kind of pivotal moments. Um, for us where we thought, you know what? I think now the the nature of participation is changing a little bit. People want to enjoy themselves. Like they're they're looking to the outdoors as an elixir for a stressed out, overscheduled yeah. life. And and then they want to go out there and have a great moment. They want to share that with people. So I think, you know, and and sort of in lockstep with how participation's changed, my own life has changed. I mean, I got married, had two kids. I'm doing a lot less ice climbing these days and more camping with the kids and stuff like that. So it's evolved. And, and I think back to directly answer your question, we have more than one target audience, but those target audiences, um, what they have in common is a real love and respect for being outdoors and a belief that it's necessary as human beings. Like we need to be, we need to spend for our mental and physical health, we need to spend time outdoors. And those are the people across all forms of participation, whether it's backpacking, fishing, hunting, overlanding, if it's done respectfully and it's about that fundamental appreciation for adventure, then we want to to help enhance your experience outdoors. Yeah, for sure. I I, I fully agree. I think that the participation has completely changed. And I, I, uh, I, I kind of feel like I'm a perfect example of that because I, I didn't grow up camping. I didn't grow up in the woods. I didn't grow up mountaineering. I am the dad who goes camping. And I started backpacking like almost 10 years ago. So not very long ago. 
Yeah. Uh, but for some reason, people watch what I do. And so I yeah. think that there's this connection that they can relate. They can relate. Right. Yeah. I mean, they don't relate to the guy hanging off a cliff. Uh, miserable. Like you said, it's like one, they think, well, how, how am I ever going to do that? So it's already unattainable. And why would I ever want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fully. Yeah, I think, I think part of it too, right, Dan, is there is an arc of participating and, you know, I think, you know, in the beginning, maybe you've done a few hikes, maybe you've spent some time in the, in the park in your city and you've realized the magnetism of it. Now you've done some day hikes, but when you think of doing an overnight overnight, you're like, how in the world could any, like, what would that be like? Like that sounds yeah. terrifying. Yeah. Then you do your first overnight and it's demystified and you think, okay, I got, I got this. I want to do, I want to do a multi night. At some point you may get to that point where you're climbing grade five ice, you know, or you're tackling a huge mountain. Maybe once you've got to that point, you're also not listening to guys like you and me, you know, like, 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 right. then, you know, your stuff, you know, and, and you've got your kit and you're doing your thing. But I think, and this is something we've realized at Nemo through the pandemic, um, we were spending way too much time talking to people just like us, like in our early years, all our language was tailored to people who kind of already knew what was going on. And when we saw 10, 12 million new participants in the outdoors in 21, 22, we thought, Holy cow. geez, you know, yeah, we better, we better, we better adjust how we're talking a little bit so that these people really feel invited into the outdoors and they want to stick around. Wow. Uh, so I think, I think, I think that's a really like you and we are trying to communicate to the folks who are on that journey and, uh, you know, wanting to be more engaged, wanting to learn more. And that's, a, I think that's a really important thing for our industry to do in general. Yeah. I, I, I sort of feel like, um, you know, I, I'm from an area where <laughs> backpacking just doesn't exist here in Wisconsin or very little. Somebody in Wisconsin is going to get mad when they hear that, but it's very little, right? It's just yeah. not a lot. And I think it's been interesting to see, uh, cause I take a lot of people brand new, never been hiking before, never been back, never been camping before and just get them be like, Hey man, it's really not as bad as you think. Like to get them out and to spend the night in the tent and they wake up comfortable and they're like, Oh, <laughs> Yeah, I actually like that. You know, it's type two fun, maybe, but whatever. But at the end of the day, they're they're wanting to go back and do it again. Yeah. I find super interesting. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> I got some product questions for you. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sure one question that my audience uh, would love to know is uh, why don't you use DCF to make tents? And I'm sure you've probably got a good reason for this. I would just love to hear it. We actually have. Um... Back in the day, um, we did some experimenting with it. I actually have a bivy bat, like uh, a single person air supported shelter, uh, kind of our version of a bivy that we made with Dyneema um, years ago when I think it was called Cuban fiber at the time. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, I think what's appealing about it is obviously weight and strength. What was not appealing to us about it um was the ability to really waterproof the construction of it you know like it, by itself it's inherently you know waterproof but the seams are challenging to do you know and and the bivy that i have in my gear closet that i kind of early prototype that i kept um you know we had had to actually hand tape all of the seams to construct it and uh and we never got past you know really making a reliable joint there um in the in the fabric panels um and also did not love you know there's sort of two other things about it that don't fit well with what we're trying to do here one is it's noisy as can be you know there's there's kind of a inherent yep. um quality to it that's not you know not not very pleasing and it's super expensive so you know over the years we've we went from in the in the very beginning, you know, we we didn't have the scale or the resources to develop our own materials. So for those first few years, you know, back in the early two thousands, you know, we were basically buying off the shelf fabrics and you know putting our own colors to them. Today, every textile we use, uh, we develop, and you know, and we've we've been able to develop some really awesome materials that approach the weight of Dyneema 
um, but are m much less expensive, much easier to, you know, really optimize from the beginning to be able to make um, a strong and waterproof seam that aren't noisy. So the gap has narrowed a lot in the performance. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we're delivering a better value to the customer. You know, yes, you could get incrementally lighter and, and there is definitely a customer out there who will pay anything, who will take well, yep. know, crinkly <laughs> right. in order to get that incrementally lighter, but, um, and totally respect that. There's a reason why I kept one of those in my basement. It's fun to have that in the kit, but, um, but I think, you know, really what we're trying to do is is drive maximum value to the customer, like give them the best experience in the outdoors for their dollar possible. And that that's, we haven't, we haven't been able to find a place in that um, calculation for Dyneema. Okay. Uh, another question I got for you is, uh, do you think you'll ever make a trekking pole tent? We have, we, we made a backpackers editor's choice award-winning um, trekking pole tent called the meta, really? the meta family, the meta 2P won the awards. I think it was, maybe 2016, if I remember correctly, a great trekking pole tent. It's, it was interesting, you know, so many things in our industry kind of go through these phases and they seem to be like six years long, <laughs> you know, um, and, and we kind of, you know, we hit the trekking pole craze, trekking pole tent craze, um, right in the sweet spot, you know, won, won an award, made, you know, made some really nice tents. And then we watched those sales really trickle down to I think that's coming back. Now again, I, I respect in that you're, you know, some of your audience um are, you know, the true gearheads looking for the kind of bespoke cottage industry, really customized um stuff. With the scale that Nemo's at now, it's 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 impractical for us to make something we're only going to make 20 of. Um yeah. you know, and so we we had to let that go for a little bit, but it's coming back. I mean, I'll tell you that off the record, but not really, <laughs> uh, that we have a trekking pole, some trekking pole tents, um, in oh, our, cool. in our advanced development room right now. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to a non-trekking pole. I just know people would love to know the, I mean, there's just interesting questions. I feel like, um, so, okay, here's a good question for you. When you're, when cam is backpacking, all right, what gear are you taking? What is the, are you, are you, are you secretly taking other brands with you to test them out? Okay. I'm sure you are. I could, I could, if I were you, I'd be having all the other brands with me testing them out. Or, or if it's just Nemo stuff, I mean, what, what's your go-to? I mean, you got access to all things Nemo. What are you grabbing? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, there's a couple parts to that. I'll try to make it simple. I, uh, you got into backpacking 10 years ago. I got into the sportsman activities 10 years ago, kind of late in life. I realized I wanted to, I wanted to be able to call myself a, an angler. I wanted to be able to call myself a hunter. Um, and, uh, and so I'm still, I'm a newbie in a, in a bunch of activities. Um, and, and when I go into those activities, I'm wanting to understand, you know, what are the, what are the marker, what are the, you know, the iconic archetypal products in these spaces and really try to understand that and talk to retailers and, you know, try to make sure that I'm, I'm, you know, well informed uh, what the right kit is, and continuing to learn there. Um, so, if I'm on a fly fishing trip, we don't make fly fishing gear. Uh, you know, I'm obviously outfitting myself with all kinds of other brands stuff. Um, but when I do that, again, I'm trying to do that really deliberately, trying to shop in a, in a very discerning way. If I'm doing an activity I've been doing here for 25 years, I may have a 25 year old piece of gear with me. I mean, we just went really, and then, oh yeah. I mean, we just you'd be surprised. Awesome. I, you know, for for 13 years, Nemo was a startup. I mean, I wasn't. I was barely paying myself. I wasn't taking gear off our shelves. Like I, it's only in the last few years that I really have gifted myself a pretty good array of our own gear. So, you know, last week we did a the product team um, and I did a. A winter overnight, and I took out my Denali, my Gregory Denali Pro Pack that I took to Alaska in two thousand eight, um, and I used that. Uh, awesome, that's awesome. So yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to let that stuff go. I sure don't want that stuff to go to the landfill. Um, and a yeah, lot of still has a lot of great life in it. So the truth, yeah, I'm, you know, if it's something I've been doing for a long time, I'm using, and it's it sentimental too, right? I mean, there's some value to it, it is, there. Yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. For sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, but they broke them. A lot of that stuff was great gear. It was back when we were a little, frankly, a little less obsessed with weight. And and uh, and so it's bomber. You know, a lot of that, that gear from that era is really bomber stuff. So are you, uh, I know, um, I, I see you've teased a little bit about backpacks. What, what do you got coming for backpacks? Yeah, so we're, we, we're, we just launched our, duffel, our, our uh, excuse me, we just launched our duffel bags. Um, that is the beginning for us of building out a whole family of what we might call carry systems. So ultimately we will have backpacking backpacks, um, but you know, that's a long journey. And, uh, and, you know, to start this year, um, we're launching a couple of more like everyday use um, packs, uh, a, a really sweet um, little technical pack for kind of weekend activities and, and one more focused on kind of active lifestyle commuting, you know, something you could ride your bike into work, but have, you know, your, uh, your rock shoes and chalk bag in um, to hit the, the, uh, the, uh, the rock gym after work kind of thing. Okay. So how far out are you, would you say on a backpacking backpack? That's what my, my viewers are wondering right now. They're thinking about it. When's the Nemo backpack? Cause I've tried, I've seen other brands do it recently. Big Agnes, did their whole backup line or backup backpack line pretty recently. Um, I, I, I mean, the community has very mixed results on it, you know, yeah. it's a mixed yeah. bag. Uh, yeah. I thought the one I got was one of the worst backpacks I've ever used. I, I gave it away. I, I couldn't even use it. It was so bad yeah. after I used it. But anyway, I'm just curious. When, did, when do you think uh, backpacking backpacks will come out? Well, it's exactly for the reason that you just said that we're really taking our time. So we did our first backpack drawings 17 years ago. We have patents for backpacks all the way back to 2007, 2008. Um, so, wow. you know, we sometimes take a very long time to bring things to market. When we launched our Stargaze chair, we did the first drawing of Stargaze in 2012. We launched it in 2018. Um, so, you know, it's, we want to be very, we're, we're not in a rush. We're majority family owned. We don't have private equity guys saying you got to double size your business. Yeah. Right. Um, the mission is lasting an iconic brand. So, you know, we, uh, we're not greedy. Um, you know, we want to, if we're going to do something, we want to do it right. And, uh, and I, I really don't have, we don't have a, a, a commitment to when we will phase each stage okay. of, kind of building out these carry systems. It's really, let's see how this year goes, what we learned from that. We're going to, we'll have a next iteration um, for next year. We'll add a little more to the family and we'll keep going like that. And when we feel like we've got a really great backpack um, with a new, that offers a new experience, that's part of it is we will not bring anything to market that's the same as what's out there. When we feel like we've got that and we've had the chance to test it and vet it out, then we'll bring it to market. I'd say within the next, you know, five, six years, but beyond that's hard yeah. to say. Well, I feel like you guys are doing a pretty good job already of uh putting out products that people um seem to really like. Um yeah, I mean <clears throat> I've said it a hundred times on my channel. I think the Nemo Hornet is the best. Uh, freestanding, semi-freestanding tent out there. That's my favorite. It is, oh, from, you. you know, from a from a. And I'm not. I, this is not me bl blowing fluff because you're on here. Uh, so I think you guys are doing some things right. Um, I got one. I guess I want to ask you about your your Moonlight Elite chair that just came out. Um, uh, so in the design process, uh, was the Helinox Chair Zero in the back of your mind as you guys were making that? Was it? Was this like a? Was this like a one upper? I, I I gotta imagine it was like you're just like how can we outdo this chair? Well, I think for us the the furniture journey really kind of goes back to to Stargaze. I got to answer that. I got to tell you a little bit about where we came from. So, like I mentioned, we we did the first drawing for Stargaze, um, you know, which is the larger swinging and auto reclining chair. Did the first drawing for that in 2012. We brought that to market in 2018. When we set out to do that, it really came from feeling like we want to do furniture. We think there's an opportunity to, to make a better experience in the furniture realm. Um, but we will only do it 
if we can do something truly unique. And it was actually years before 2012 that we started that brainstorming. And it, and it wasn't until 2012 that we hit on, we've got it, let's do a swinging chair. No one, there was no chair um, that we could find anywhere, not just in the outdoor space, that was a, a basically like a one person hammock in the form factor of a, of a chair. And, and we saw the Helinox things and A-Lite, which was really the originator of, of that kind of form factor, if you remember the A-Lite brand, um, and all the other stuff that was on the market. When we started thinking about um, making furniture, what we observed was most of the, a lot of the stuff on the market um, was marketed, was being marketed as backpacking chairs. And we just couldn't see many backpackers really wanting to carry a chair, almost no matter how light it was. And and we also saw a lot of people reacting in reviews that the chairs looked flimsy, felt kind of scary to sit in, like they might explode, um, you know, maybe didn't fit certain body shapes and things. So our thought was with Stargaze, let's go the other direction. Let's make the ultimate campfire chair. And, uh, and that's really where we kicked off, um, you know, our furniture journey was trying to make just this amazing sitting experience for kind of around a campfire. Once once we kind of did that, got that out there, you know, iterated a few years, you know, we kind of dialed in some details as we learned. Um, we looked back at those kind of quote backpacking chairs and, and to answer your question directly, yeah, we saw that um, the chairs, those lightweight chairs, you know, still left opportunities around a better sitting experience, around a higher quality chair. Um, and, you know, and that's what we've tried to do with Moonlight is introduce, you know, the ability to recline to kind of adjust your sitting position and a higher level of um, of manufacturing quality. So, you know, welded corners and ball and socket joints and aluminum hubs um, versus kind of this the some of the more generic stuff up there. Yeah, no, I... I think you did a pretty good job. Um, yeah, we uh, we've been using that the elite the past few trips out there. I'm not yeah. going to share with you. I'm not going to share with you my results yet. But yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll, well, I'll, I'll make you sweat a little bit. But yeah, I'll just I'll I'll tell you uh, it's it's an enjoyable experience for sure. Good, good. Yeah, I mean, I think you're you know we've got a a good thing going with you where you've built up you know, such a great audience and a credible way you do things, you know, that we're happy to send you some things before they've gone to production, um, which is a nerve, speaking of nerves, is a nerve wracking spot for us because, you know, it, until something is, is, has been kicked off with production, um, we are sorting out, you know, uh, last minute issues and kind of get, and, and the level of, reliability and the making of prototypes is very different than once what's the production um, uh, line is kind of set up. So, you know, there's always the risk when we send you stuff early that there's going to be some issues with it. Um, hopefully yeah. that's good. You know, you've gotten some good prototypes there, but, um, but that chair has just gone to market and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of where it's turned out in part because there's a level of industrial design to it, you know, just, you know, a, a real attention to detail and a beauty and the hardware and things like that, that I think is another level um, from a lot of the stuff that we see in that space. And, uh, and that's fun to me. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you uh, coming on here. Give me the uh, hour or so that we've already had a chance to talk. Great to finally meet you. I can, I can, uh, I can say that you are not elusive. All right. You're not the Wizard of Oz hiding behind some curtain. You you do exist. You're real. You're a real person. So that's good. And uh, yeah, it was great meeting you. Hopefully we'll meet you in person sometime or see you out there or be able to test some stuff together. That might be fun, too. So, yeah, that'd be great, Dan. Well, again, thank you for for having me and would love to have you out to our headquarters. So if you're up for the trip, um, let's go. Yeah. I think you'd enjoy seeing our facility is pretty cool. I mean, it's like a design and engineering firm you know, more than it is uh, what you might think of as a, as a brand. Uh, when I look out here, I mean, it's all, you know, industrial designers, developers, engineers with cool stuff around. We got a really cool lab in our space and stuff. It, it'd be fun to show you. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks a lot, Cam. I appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you.